anyway, appreciate it. And I'm going to open this with the rational fears. Okay. You are assaulted by a platypus with attitudes spouting platitudes. While driving, you get a hallucinogenic high from the scent of fresh asphalt. You fly from Cleveland to Detroit nonstop without the assistance of an aircraft. You break open an egg and unleash a universe where intelligent life is impossible. You live to be older than your parents when they die. Somewhere in space-time, you are their parents. Al Capone returns from the dead to infect your loved ones with syphilis. You are forced to participate in the new avant-garde concerto for snapped bungee cords. After screaming, I'm dying, your lover dies in your arms. You are convicted of necrophilia. Lying on your deathbed, you receive the formula for your cure in a vision. No one listens. You step outside. It is not Halloween, yet everyone is wearing a mask. <laughs> that one, of course, is not that irrational. It's been recently added. Now, Tom Stone, who could come from San Francisco, should appreciate this poem. He once uh, said of my troubled youth that I went through life as if a giant foot was going to come out of the sky <laughs> and step on me. Anyway, so there you have irrational fears. Here's White Castle, another poem from my youth. White Castle, as teenagers with cars and without girlfriends, we frequently drove to hamburger stands, a ritual substitute for hunting and mating. We would drive extra miles to the Lindbrook White Castle instead of the nearby Hempstead branch to see the machine lady at work, a thin brunette about 40 years old who flipped the little onion fleck squares in the orderly formation on the grill before her with robotic precision, her cheeks aglow with intense concentration. One time, several burgers ahead of schedule, she looked up our eyes locked for a few seconds. It was the closest I got to getting laid. <laughs> I read that one at, um, at uh, the poetry slam at uh, the Green Mill. <laughs> the audience, you know, they were half drunk. They loved that. <laughs> anyway, here's, here's near sunset. When my mother did not feel up to cooking and lay in bed, I would sit at the kitchen table and look through the thin curtains at the late afternoon sun. In the middle of the blazing light, I would see a blue disc oscillating like a wobbly coin. I would imagine people streaming out of the sun as a line of shadows, making their way to earth to begin life anew. Then I would open a can of chicken stew or Chef Boyardee and cook dinner. Okay, that's about my mom. Here's about my dad. Me, my dad, and George Sternweiss. One, during the 1940s, my father delivered bread for Dugan's, Bakers for the Home since 1878, in Crestwood, the ritzy mansion section of Yonkers, New York. One of his customers was George Sternweiss, my father, five years older, always called him Georgie. New York Yankee second baseman who won the American League batting title in 1945 with a 309 average, lowest winning average in baseball history until Yaz hit 301 in 1968 and they lowered the pitcher's mound. Two, Georgie sold his Model A Ford to my father. The engine leaked oil, so my dad rigged up a baking pan to catch the blackish brown droplets and pour them back into the oil fill hole. I love the Model A because my dad would drive it to a crest on Gun Hill Road, rev the engine, and with gravity's assist, zoom down to the bottom of the slope where a frame rattling bump propelled me up from the back seat where Jolt and Joe had sat so high that my head hit the roof of the car, unleashing a burst of three-year-old glee. Three, at 9.16 a.m., September 15th, 1958, while I sat in first period at Calhoun High, George Sternway sprinted across the platform of the Jersey Central Station at Red Bank and jumped into the front car as it edged forward. The commuter train bound from Manhattan blew through three bright red stop signals 
hurtled toward an opening drawbridge. The engineer, for reasons still unknown, did not apply the brakes until eight feet from the steel-beamed mouth to nowhere. The front car, with the next three following, plunged like bombs into Newark Bay, and George Sternweiss never surfaced. Four, during the 70s, when I urged my father to exercise, he laughed over his beer. If Georgie Sternweiss was in my shape, he would have missed that train in Jersey, and he'd still be alive today. During the 80s, while I drove him over lush green wetlands and briny bay to Jones Beach, my father screamed through the haze of dementia. There are no sharks in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, as I approach the last train to nowhere, I too defy logic. For in dimly lit coffee houses and bars, I cry out, please sit next to me in the back seat of Georgie Sternweiss's Model A Ford. Okay, this, this next one, um, actually the Poetry the Poets Club helped me with this one, as with some of the others. This is called uh, The Four Seasons. Um, it's about Vivaldi. And also there's a, a section, kind of a prose section about Vivaldi. And then there's a haiku-like poem after it, one for each of the four seasons. It's a little bit in the style of a Senru Japanese poem. And I'm gonna have a little background music for this one. You'll have to excuse me for a second. A little Vivaldi softly in the background. The Four Seasons. Vivaldi was born March 4th, 1678, meteorological spring in Venice, already a tourist beacon, a prime stop on the grand tour of the European wealthy. He was baptized immediately because of his troubled breathing, most likely asthma. His condition, though lasting, a, casting a lifelong shadow, provided the rationale for Vivaldi an ordained priest to decline religious duties and devote himself to music. That moment when no longer buds, not yet leaves, tree blooms fill the streets with soft green haze. Vivaldi landed his first and longest lasting job in September 1703 autumn as Maestro di Violoni, Violono for Aspidella del Pieta an orphanage for out of wedlock daughters of rich nobles. Much of his music, including the four quartets, the four seasons was written for the talented female orchestra. Vivaldi maintained ties with Ospedale throughout his travels, many in pursuit of operatic success until he left Venice in 1740. Suspended beneath the wave on wave patterns of a lake surface that undulates as if alive, a long red maple leaf. Vivaldi died in summer, July 1741. He had left Venice with the previous year for various reasons. The city's economic downturn, his compositions falling out of favor, rumors which he denied about his live-in relationship with soprano Anno Giro. He hoped for support from Charles VI, an ardent friend who had knighted him, but the emperor died and Vivaldi falling into poverty soon followed. Confronting the mind with the reality that the intense heat searing one's skill, skin has traveled 63 million miles. La Quattro Stagioni received its first American recording with violinist Louis Kaufman for Naxos in winter December 1947. An earlier recording in 1942 replaced harpsichord with piano and added romantic orchestration. So Noxo's first recording claim can be seen as justified. Vivaldi's revival is largely due to the 1926 discovery of a huge collection of his works thought to have perished. Through the ice coated branches of an oak tree, Venus next to the sliver of an almost new moon, the only heavenly lights visible in the urban sky. Okay. Excuse me while I turn off the music. Okay. And picking up on that last little bit, tree naked in winter. 
layer upon layer of gray brown branches wave against blue white sky, pattern within pattern, intricate like congealed lightning. High up the thin strands of an abandoned bird's nest flutter in the stiff wind. Standing here, even in my down coat, I feel chilled. Imagine one so entranced by a tree naked in winter that he fails to go indoors. When I reach home, I will drink hot tea, sit by the fireside and meditate on how often beauty is interlaced with danger. I don't have a fireplace, but I did for that poem. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> here's four slices of winter. One, oh, Sam has to help me out for this. Hold on a second. He has a line. <laughs> Only one, it's disgusting, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Playing Ask the Professor, a student MC reads a question another student has submitted. It's a routine I use as an icebreaker. Why are you so high on life? Through the voice of my iguana hand puppet, I answer, because he has so little of it left. <laughs> Two, this winter I am under house arrest, my imagination frozen like thin hollow ice that cracks underfoot. Three, one evening we Skyped my grandson and daughter-in-law. He smiled like crazy when he saw me. If my grandson doesn't get into state-sponsored daycare, the waiting list numbers a thousand. I hope his grandparents in Japan will look after him. When I wrote, I would volunteer in a heartbeat in my journal I keep for him. I realized that I love him as if he were my own son. I cannot think of a clever twist for the end of this story. Four, when I hear the hush of the humidifier, I remember the hush of the mountains surrounding a crater lake in Japan. I remember sailing across the lake on a make-believe pirate ship. I remember riding in a cable car, packed tighter than the rush hour subway to a summit where cumulus clouds caught in a downdraft blurred like waterfalls. Recently in Chicago, the rats have been uh, coming out in force. Um, we had two of them in our basement. <laughs> if I had more time, I could describe my encounter, but uh, instead what I'll do is I'll read an older poem that I, uh, people tend to like uh, about an encounter I had a rat with, in a rat one summer here in Chicago. It's called Bizarre, Backyard Bizarre or Moby Rat. Is this Chicago or the steamy Congo? Rats do not get that big in the civilized world. <clears throat> 2 a.m., excuse me a sec. <clears throat> 2 a.m. <clears throat> I have this postnatal drip. <clears throat> 2 a.m., air still as John Dillinger's corpse. Walking from the garage, I near the back door in a mist of innocence. Rash rush of leaves. Gray torpedo surges from ivy ground cover. It's right in front of me. I expletive a holy shit, embodying sheer awe at the size of the beast and abject fear of its razor diseased teeth. The creature from the ivy lagoon taking my outcry as a war cry from a significantly larger mammal accelerates like a floored Ferrari into the dark safety of the neighbor's shadows. A close encounter of the sickening kind. How big was it? Fucking huge, like a full length shoebox. And that's not counting the tail. No, it was not a muskrat. Have you Alzheimer's? I said it was a torpedo. Muskrats are cannonball fat. Rats are torpedo fat, even when they're fat for a rat. <clears throat> I should have recognized the omen. Last week, I opened the back door just beyond the welcome mat a pair of gnawed rabbit legs. No other rabbit remains. Evil rats. Are they taunting me with these raw mangled symbols of good luck? Have we bred a mutant species with 16 tons of green pellet decon poison and kilotons of mercury fumes and hydrocarbon exhaust falling on us like fallout? The new super rat, faster than a speeding rabbit, more carnivorous than an alley cat, more conniving than a hypocrite, larger than a raging shoebox, 
Ah, please tell me, is this still Chicago? Or is it Chicago, a real live, dread thumping heart of darkness? <clears throat> I was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me a sec. I was kind of freaked out when, uh, when the rat hits and I, I felt a lot better after I wrote that poem, the, the rat in the yard. The ones in the basement, <laughs> something else. Okay. We discovered where they're coming in from and sealed it up with um, copper wire. I'm going to cl close this off with the last poem from my um, uh, rock and roll dreams, love poem. What is it about love that it rules over song lyrics as surely as churchgoers dominate the political scene? Why not tunes about peaches or pizza? What is it about love that singers of love songs, more taken by themselves than the song's beloved, sound as real as artificial frosting? What is it about love that when you're caught in its savage sweet gales, the frosting melts and all the song lyrics taste of true? What is it about love so natural and basic, yet lovers sense triumph over niceties and norms and yearn to boast about it to the entire world? What is it about love, its central act carnal and messy, that it craves delicacy? lace fringes and flower petals, cherubs and multifaceted diamond. What is it about love that it is simultaneous spawner of our most acute joys and our darkest betrayals? Two-faced Janice, Jekyll and Hyde. What is it about love that when I look into your eyes, I see sensuous circles, bedrooms and cloakrooms, Tigers and tempests, lava lakes and glaciers, flamingos dancing flamenco, auroras shining in daylight sky, a child's fingers, an old woman's lips, the beginning of possibility, the finale of time, and it all makes sense to me. Thanks.